Just ahead on Black Issues Forum, from the governor to county leaders, the upcoming November election means more than just who will be our next president. For North Carolina, it's the future of our schools, access to affordable health care, and the economic opportunities in black and underserved communities. We're asking the questions, who are these candidates and what do they stand for? Stay tuned as we break down the issues and spotlight the races that could transform our neighborhoods. Coming up next, stay with us. Quality public television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting PBSNC. Welcome to Black Issues Forum. I'm your host, Kenya Thompson. Well, North Carolina is at a pivotal crossroads, and this year's gubernatorial race, along with other key county decisions, could dramatically shift the course of our black communities. Many counties are looking at potential shifts in leadership, and some are asking what those changes might mean. We've got a lot to unpack, so we're going to get right into it. I want to introduce our guest for today. Our first guest is a co-host of WUNC's Due South, a local source for news information and perspectives from across North Carolina and the South. I want to welcome Leonita Inch. And joining her is a familiar face on our show, our friend and political analyst, Steve Rao. Welcome to the show. Good morning. Of course. Nice Thanks for having, for, for being here. Um, I want to start off with the governor's race. It's been hot nationally, maybe even internationally, who knows, right? But we've, we've seen um, a leak of information that has come out about Mark Robinson. Uh, we know that Mark Robinson and Josh Stein are both running for this seat. Um, but as of recent, we've heard um, details about Internet activity stemming from about 10, maybe 15 years ago at this point. Um, Mark Robinson has coined himself in the past as Black Nazi. Um, he's in support of slavery. And this has really damaged his campaign, right? We've seen plenty of his um, campaign leaders step down. He... It's not having much support. I'd love to hear from both of you, Leonita. Um, what are your thoughts around how damaging this has been to his campaign? Well, I think it's been very damaging. And he knows that. I was getting calls not too long ago, and they were saying, um, Mark Robinson's wife is speaking for him now. Oh. And because we know um, it's too late for him to remove himself from, from the ballot. Right. And. You know, I always watch this race, even before this, because mm -hmm. it was remarkable that even a black man had gotten this far in a gubernatorial race in the country. Yes. And, you know, it was so really wow. Now, I've never gotten the chance to interview him, even mm -hmm. though I've tried, I've, yeah. you know, in, pub yeah. in public radio, you sent out feelers. So I never got the chance to actually interview him. But um, he knows, and his staff, we know, knows that he's in a lot of trouble in this race. Mm -hmm. You know, even the latest poll numbers show that um, Josh Stein has him by um, double digits. And also, um, the latest numbers from the Elon University poll, mm -hmm. it actually said that 78% of black voters support Stein. Yeah. So it's yeah. not even really about yeah. colors, no. what's coming out of your mouth. Right. And um, so... Yeah. Right. He's in trouble. Point. That's a great point, Steve. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, you know, when you go back when this whole thing started, I mean, first of all, you know, let's put this in perspective. This is the most important office in the state, the chief executive of officer, CEO yeah. of the eighth largest state in the union, right? You're dealing with health care, education, jobs, AI, the future jobs, uh, public safety, the environment. And for two years, we never really heard Lieutenant Governor Robinson talk about those issues. We heard a lot of the negative comments, people need a killing, a woman shouldn't lift up her skirt, right. all of that. So we already, I think, independents and undecideds were leaning towards Stein. Mm -hmm. But I think with these recent statements, uh, have really, uh, it's like the Titanic, right? It's a sinking ship. They've hit the iceberg. Uh, people are resigning from his campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, even senior Republicans like Senator Tom, United States Senator Tom Tillis are saying that the governor's race is pretty much over. Yeah. So I think it's fair to say that Stein is going to win. I think he has double-digit lead in the poll. So he'll be packing up his boxes and we'll have a new governor come November 5th, a governor-elect, and he'll be sworn in in January most likely. But I, I think at the end of the day, the question becomes, you know, how did Robinson get this far, uh -huh. right? Why did this stuff not come up sooner? Right. And, uh, you know, what will the effect be? We'll probably talk about in a few minutes about 
what effect will this governor's race have on That's the election? That's what I was going to say, yeah. right? So and Trump pretty much kind of cherry-picked right. him, right, and, yeah. and has supported him since he's put in his right. candidacy. How could that trickle down to I, the broader election? Well, I'll, I'll take a stab at this, but, I mean, I think there's a couple of things to observe. I mean, number one, I think that there could be potentially a down-ballot effect mm -hmm. with Stein if he does so well Will those voters then go down the ballot in these other council of state races, lieutenant governor, attorney general, right. auditor, we're going to talk about some of these races, labor commissioner, the courts, Congress, right. even the legislature that would help uh, the Stein as a governor not have to deal with the supermajority, mm -hmm. right? The second thing is the Harris campaign, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, North Carolina is at play, and if they win North Carolina, she'll become the next president of the United States. Well, as Governor Cooper has said, there's a lot of energy at the top of the ticket with black voters. She's the first Asian American, Asian American voters. We've talked about that on the radio. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you couple that with this down ballot effect in the state that Trump only won by one and a half percent. You've got to think the Trump folks are worried that this race was, you know, like on the 20 yard line. I love football now. <laughs> right. uh, they're about to throw the ball in the end zone, and yeah. all of a sudden, the ball, the, now the Democrats have the ball. So I think that's that's the thing to look for is. You know, or is it not going to really matter with the presidential election? And are people just going to say, forget Robinson, we're going to vote for Trump? Right. We'll find out in a few weeks. Well, I'm sure Stein and a lot of top Democrats nationally and in the state would hope it would go that way, wouldn't they? Of course. Yeah. But we know North Carolina voters. Uh, they would vote mm -hmm. for Roy Cooper for governor and Mark Robinson for lieutenant governor and split, split, split the ticket. Split yeah. the ticket. Yeah. Every time. Yeah. And, you know, I've been doing stories and talking to folks, say, like in Georgia, mm -hmm. and where Georgia, for example, has a, a Republican governor, but two Democratic U.S. senators, and then flip North Carolina, you know, we have a Democratic yeah. governor. And yeah. yeah. People vote. They, I think they're a little bit smarter than we, we think they are. They vote for who they want right. in office. And not just a straight ticket. We right. forget 42% of our state. I heard Wesley Harris say this at an event. He's the Democratic nominee for treasurer. 42% mm -hmm. of our state is from rural North Carolina. Right. So that's the thing is, you know, it may not matter to these people in these other surrounding counties and suburban areas. So I, I agree with you, Leonetta. I think it's I think it's still a close race, but they shouldn't take it for granted that just because Robinson's gone down that they're all going to win. Right. So that, do yeah. you think Josh Stein is kind of just riding on the coattails of all this news and or is he being effective with his campaign? Oh, well. You go ahead. No, I'm just going by sometimes the political ads I see. They're very laid back. Yeah. They may not even show him right. in the ad. He's yeah. been pretty smart about that, uh -huh. just quiet and really letting Mark Robinson speak for himself. Okay. Yeah. Ad after ad. Right. I, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. I think he's been effective. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm, uh, you know. The, but that has yeah. been effective. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I think that, I mean, I think that he's uh, um, he's been trained by you know, a great governor, the protege of Governor Cooper. Um, he's, you know, love the analogy of the quarterback, right? You read defenses, you make quick, smart decisions. And I think uh, when Joe Montana retired, they didn't just pan pass the ball to uh, to <laughs> someone in the bleachers. No, they yeah. didn't. They, 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 they picked somebody. And I think that's the, that's the thing is I think that um, he's tackled a lot of the tough issues as AG, whether yeah. it's opioid rape kits, uh, the, the environment, uh, both as a senator and AG. So I think that... Um, He's won an effective campaign, but I think at the end of the day, I think he's he's ready to, to be the governor, and I think he's waited 25, 30 years to get to this point, and yeah. I think uh, he's going to do a great job. I know, so but. should Josh Stein or Mark Robinson get into office, what will be one of the first things you think North Carolinians want them to focus on? Leonita? Well, definitely... <laughs> It's always jobs. Yeah. It's it's always jobs. And I've heard some, you know, we've we've gotten some news releases that jobs are coming, but when you talk to everyday people, they're worried about so, their jobs. Yeah. So maybe they're just not the types of jobs that um, a lot of North Carolinians are groomed and trained to have. So maybe some of those types of jobs are coming. Yeah. But um, people are, it seems they're back to some, some of the numbers. They're trying to look for two and three jobs again. Mm -hmm. um, it's just really tough. Um, you know, the interest rate is coming down. That may be helpful when you think of people and housing. It's really tight yeah. and yeah. tough and it expensive. Tough. Very. For yeah. us, right? And it's relative. Because right. we've got a bunch of people coming to North Carolina right. now for the reason that it's a lot cheaper. I want to kind of move the conversation on to some other key races because, you know, I think it's important, and we've been talking about this over and over again, that it's not just the presidential race. Local positions are just as important, if not more important. One of the key races that's kind of on our 
um, scope is the state auditor race, right? So I think it's been two years now since Beth Wood had to step down due to some situations that happened. Jessica Holmes is, has been interim in that position, and now she is going to be running up against Dave Bolick. And, um, you know, we've heard Beth Wood discredit her ability to be state auditor. Um, and she's going to be supporting the Republican candidate. Steve, what are your thoughts on that? And <laughs> is Jessica fit to to stay in the seat? Well, I mean, I think, first of all, um, to me as a voter, it wouldn't really matter whether Beth Wood endorsed her or not because mm -hmm. she's no longer the auditor and she was forced to resign from office. Right. So my litmus test would be that the chief executive of our state, Governor Roy Cooper, a Moorhead Kane scholar, probably one of the best governors in the country, who probably could have been vice president, said that I'm picking Jessica Holmes, a former Wake County commissioner, the youngest county commissioner in the history of the state, mm -hmm. to be the auditor. So I think, first of all, I, I, would, I would not really factor Beth Wood's statement in, in any decision I would make. But does she have the experience? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, county commissioner, as the chair, she ran a multi-billion, I think about $2 billion budget. Um, She's got a great story. I mean, she had a tough life. She was homeless when she was a young kid for a little while, mm. recovered from that, went to college as a lawyer, and she's the incumbent. So she does have the experience. Bullock also has experience. Yeah. He's, he's a, you know, from the UNC Board of Trustees, a businessman. Um, and so I think it's going to be a close race, mm -hmm. but she might have the advantage of incumbency um, and also what's going to happen with the down ballot effect on these council of state races. Yeah. Any thoughts? It's also a very short incumbency, yeah. and yeah. she yeah, it's been and quick. she was appointed. You even hear them, not them. You hear a lot of people say that even about Vice President Kamala Harris. You know, like oh, she was she yeah. didn't go through the yeah. primary right. election to get you know what she was handed. But hopefully, you know, you can't worry about what a disgruntled person <laughs> says about you. But you also, I hope it has nothing to do that she, you know, she's a black woman. Mm -hmm. And when she was appointed, yeah. she was the first black yes. woman in the state right. to yeah. to have such or, a position. The youngest and first black yes. woman. Yeah. And then I think also, you know, she's represented a million people in Wake County mm -hmm. and also um, brings a lot of d diversity to the ticket, yeah. right? As a young black woman, you think of the potential. She gets real, she'll make history as the first black woman on the council mm -hmm. of state elected. But I think that, um, you know, she's run statewide. She ran for labor commissioner. Right. She's so we'll so I think when you compare these races, it's going to be interesting to watch. Yeah. And just to make clear, in the state of North Carolina, you do not have to have a CPA in order to be no, a state auditor, which not. is a certified professional accountant right. um, designation. And both of these candidates, Jessica Holmes or Dave Bullock, do not have a CPA. No, Beth Wood did. They're lawyers. But they're lawyers. They're lawyers. Right. <laughs> they're so lawyers. if anyone's looking for that kind of leverage of, well, who's the CPA and who's yeah, not, neither not, of these candidates Neither of these are. candidates. I right. Know. So let's, let's keep on going. Oh, but first, to clarify, and a state auditor does what for our state? Uh, it's the watch, financial watchdog of the state. Okay. They basically oversee uh, oversight and auditing the $100 billion of state agencies and assets. And if they find something wrong, then they'll audit you. And so so it's a, it's a really important agency yes. uh, in terms of holding state government accountable. Mm -hmm. And they've been successful in the past, even under Auditor Wood. That yeah. She was a good auditor, actually, did some good things. Good. All right. Supreme Court. All right, so Republicans have had a five to two majority on the state Supreme Court. Um, what does a Republican majority mean for North Carolina um, and black communities in particular? Well, you can look at our federal Supreme Court and the power, we you know, when you have a majority um, on such a court that has the power to make decisions that you know, disproportionately and negatively maybe affect your community and where you're from and what you need. It just makes me even think of affirmative action. Mm. It, it, I know that was on a federal level. It makes me think of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, it makes me think of issues of abortion. Yeah. Um, I know in that case you hear... Um, um, you hear um, Riggs say over and over, you know, I'm the only person on any court around here that's even of childbearing age, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. female. And um, um, she sticks to that and that she would be able to make such decisions 
hopefully, you know, in, impartially. But yeah. yeah, a lot of issues that affect, uh, disproportionately affect people of color yeah. can and probably will be decided with such a, a lopsided court. And just to clarify quickly, Allison Riggs fills the current seat. Yes. She right. was also appointed yeah. by Governor Cooper. She will be running up against her opponent, Jefferson Griffin. Right in this election. Yeah, and I mean, this this, ra this race is what I call one of the most unreported races, the Supreme Court race. And I want to first take a stab at your question of well, how does it affect black voters and yeah. voters in North Carolina? Well, first of all, if you're concerned about voting rights, you know, not allowing felon felons, you know, f that are no longer felons to uh, vote, abortion rights, uh -huh. uh, uh, funding of public education, uh -huh. you know, not, not, not pushing through the Leandro case so that every child has a constitutional right for education. Right. Um, these are issues uh, who you vote for, voter ID, uh, gerrymandering, maps that we're seeing. These are all issues of who you vote for, a woman's reproductive rights, how much funding your child receives in school, your, their school is going to receive. Mm -hmm. These are all done. So, yes, yeah, she's running against Jefferson Griffin. So he's a strict constructionist looking at the Constitution, raised about a million dollars. And he calls she's, all of that yeah, partisan. Partisan. And these are partisan that, races. You know, these are partisan right. races. They made these partisan races, which I don't think is good. Riggs has also raised a million. It's a tight race. But this is a really important race. Now, the first thing is the Republicans, if they lose the race, they still have the majority. Right. If the Democrats win and Allison Riggs wins, they don't have the majority. But it's an important race for the Democrats because if they win this race, then they can get ready for Anita Earls. And if they win that race, then they put themselves in a position they can get the majority back. But this is going to be an important race for the Democrats because right now the Supreme Court's a rubber stamp for the General Assembly. Mm -hmm. And they'll probably be the majority, right? So anyway, yeah. this is an important race. It is very important. Yeah. All right, moving on. Let's go to the Superintendent of Public Instruction. Okay. <laughs> This has been interesting, oh. very interesting. Republican <laughs> Michelle Morrow uh, raised the profile of this race when she defeated her incumbent, um, Catherine Truitt, in the primaries. Since then, though, Morrow has faced criticism for divisive social media posts, including one where she advocated for the assassination of former President Barack Obama. This is the person that is supposed to lead the decisions mm. for our schools, for our children. William Ebel, you know, what are your thoughts on that? No matter what you're running for or where you work, if you don't want to lose your job, you need to you know, stay off social media. <laughs> right. It will do you in every time. We've seen it. Um, but, you know, it, and I'm saying if you want to win, there are also some people you need not bring up or talk about and actually threaten the life of a or former president this? that's beloved by enough people that he was elected right. twice. Right. And so, it, but before even that was made, um, available for all of us to read. Just the mere fact of um, the experience that I felt she did not have and, and that most children of color, they're not homeschooled. The, you know, public schools is what, you know, the structure of that has helped and most people, children of color, are in public schools and right to now. Clarify her experience and is so more her towards... experience is to cover and to, I guess, rule over and run. Um, that that's always been like a red flag to me. Mm. Steve. Yeah, I mean, when you make statements like this, uh, regardless of whether you're a Democrat or Republican, I really think it brings into question when you want people assassinated and executed when you're attending insurrections. Right. I don't think you really should be running for an office where you're going to be an example to our children. I mean, this office should be about the standards of education, how our children are competing, are we funding, are we giving kids the resources so we can have more leaders like Jessica Holmes who mm -hmm. came through the public education system. That's what we need. Yeah. And so um, I think that this race is going to, gonna. I think Mo Green's got a better chance of winning. Her opponent. Yeah, her yes. opponent. He was the superintendent of Guilford County Schools. And under his leadership, he did uh, increase graduation rates, um, mm -hmm. academic achievement. He went to the Z. Smith Reynolds Foundation. So I th who knows what's going to happen, but I watched the debate last week. Mm -hmm. I think clearly he came across with more experience, but you never know. But that's what I would say, right? I think more, more, more focus on green, but you can't get away from these statements. I don't think you can say these kinds of things, and I don't think you should run for a council of state office. That's just my personal opinion as a, as a citizen and a voter and an analyst. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's we always think the ticket's going to go one way or another based off of things that we've heard in the media, but we don't always know that these comments are going to have impact on the ticket. We don't so, know. And we, we also know yeah. that you don't have to have a background in government 
our sure. policy, yeah, our just, anything is a prerequisite yeah. to be elected mm -hmm. to a position or a job, and that goes back even yeah. to our lieutenant governor. Yeah, mm -hmm. and just to clarify for our viewers, the superintendent of um, public instruction makes what kinds of decisions for our, our children's education? More policy decisions. Okay. I mean, I think they still, you know, the school, local school boards will still be making decisions on where your schools are and those kinds of, but they'll look at the curriculum of the schools. Mm -hmm. uh, some of these issues about the, the word that mothers against liberty, moms against liberty, you know, indoctrination, mm. uh, teaching black history in the classes, uh, what kind of books you can read and cannot right. read. These are issues at hand. But at the end of the day, I think this office is really about what are the standards of public education in North Carolina? How are you helping them get the best education compared to the states in the country? But I think there's also a position where you have to look globally mm -hmm. at what other nations are doing, like India and others, and how how the curriculums are doing. So yeah. I think that's what this job does. You're like the face of education, basically. Yes. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. face of education in North state. Carolina. Yeah. Okay. All right. Labor Commissioner. First, let's clarify what Labor Commissioner does, <laughs> because when Sherry Berry's name was all over elevators for <laughs> decades upon decades, everyone knew her, and then when her name changed, we're like, who is this person, right? And all we think of is elevators. So <laughs> tell us what a Labor Commissioner does, Steve. The Labor Commissioner, uh, the statutes in North Carolina basically say that all it does is you're helping the safety and welfare of workers of North Carolina. So that means elevator safety, boilerplate safety, mm -hmm. um, roller coasters, the state fair, right? Uh, making sure that workers are safe when they go to work. So this department does inspections. Uh, they've got a smaller staff. It's one of the smaller council state agencies. Josh Dobson's leaving. So that's what the labor commissioner does. I personally think that eventually the office should also be looking at the changing face of labor because right. many people's right. jobs are being automated away. Haven't really heard that much in this campaign, but... Um, you know, the AI Bill of Rights and things like that. But, but that's what the office does. Very right. limited in scope. And that's what it is. And currently, Attorney Luke Farley yes. is our current labor commissioner. He adapted his Make Elevators Great Again slogan. <laughs> um, yes. We know what side he's on with that <laughs> with that slogan. He is being um, faced off with Democrat Braxton Winston as his opponent. L lay out the landscape of these two gentlemen, Leonita. Well, the one thing I do know about um, Braxton Winston the second. The second. <laughs> I mean, okay. he's pro union. Yeah. Yeah. And um, uh, and that stands for a lot because when I think of this particular role and position, it's all about safety of workers and not just just making sure and hopefully that they're treated right and paid right. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think um, Luke Farley is you know opposite on definitely the the, the union end of conversations when it comes yeah. um, to workers. Yeah, and, and, it, and I think it's interesting because I know that, you know, a, a year or two ago, um, pe folks were talking to me about running for labor commissioner, but yeah. one of the reasons I didn't do it was because John Hardister was going to be the presumptive nominee, and everyone thought that he was, he was moderate, popular, and he surprisingly lost to Farley. Mm. So this is going to be an interesting race. Brig Winston and Farley are not one statewide. I think Brent Winston has a better, ch has a good chance, but being from an urban city like Charlotte, sometimes it's harder to win statewide races, mm -hmm. and Farley has the labor law experience. Uh, he did support, he is supported by Trump, and I'd be curious to see whether he supported Robinson. Right. <laughs> I don't know if he did or not, but that yeah. could come back to, uh, to now, hurt him. Obviously, again, we talked about protection of jobs and safety, but that has nothing to do with the jobs coming into the state. Correct, Labor Commissioner. It doesn't. I would yeah. think not. So they're it, two different. It, it, things. Yeah, it doesn't. That's yeah. more economic development and commerce. But right. sometimes I wonder whether it should be because mm -hmm. it seems like Labor Commissioner shouldn't labor be about jobs, but yeah. it's about elevators and inspections and you know. But one thing I know, WNC Public Radio is focusing on and looking closely at this race is really. Um, Safety, heat safety. Yeah. Uh, you know, those are employees and workers who do just about everything yeah. outside. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to make sure that our viewers know that as Election Day approaches, PBS North Carolina wants to make sure that our viewers are prepared to vote. You can find more information about Election Day, voter registration deadlines, early voting, voter ID, and so much more. Make sure you visit pbsnc.org slash vote for additional details. Well, I'm grateful for this conversation. Um, it's been it's been enlightening, and I think yeah. our viewers hopefully have enough information now to go forward and, and vote.
a lot of decisions to be made, and yeah. uh, early voting starts soon, and uh, it's going to be an interesting uh, couple weeks. Indeed. Thank you. And I'm just happy to see so many people of color actually running for some of the top yes. offices in this state. It's Same. exciting. We've, yes, I noticed that. That excites me. That's, that's great. It's good. Yeah. Well, thank good. You. Steve Rao, Leonida Ng, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And I thank you for watching. If you want more content like this, we invite you to engage with us on Instagram using the hashtag Black Issues Forum. You can also find our full episodes on pbsnc.org slash Black Issues Forum and on the PBS video app. I'm Kenya Thompson. I'll see you next time. Quality Public Television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting PBSNC.